I'd like to remind all of our participants, both those of you in the room and those of you joining us online, that you have until 9 a.m. on Wednesday morning, local time, to vote for your favorite Young Economist paper. The traditional wisdom in central banking has held that policymakers should look through volatility in prices caused by shocks emanating from the supply side. However, in situations where surges risk having second round effects, such wisdom looks unwise. Today's first session will explore under which conditions policymakers should respond to situations such as those in recent years when supply shocks have combined to produce inflation that has proven both more strong and more persistent than expected. We'll then move straight on to a second session when we'll, dis when we'll discuss who pays for inflation and by how much. The first session will be chaired by Fabio Panetta, executive board member at the European Central Bank, the second by his board colleague, Frank Elderson. Just as a reminder, we'd welcome questions both from the audience here in the room and via Zoom. Mr. Panetta, the floor is yours. Thank you, Claire. Good morning, uh, everybody. Welcome to this first session on monetary policy in the face of multiple supply shocks. This topic goes to the heart of the situation that central banks have been facing uh, as of late. In just a few years, we have seen a terrible sequence of shocks. We had a pandemic, severe supply chain disruptions, a war, an energy crisis, and let's hope this is the end of this sequence. Uh, Claire uh, just reminded us that central banks would usually want to be patient as inflation typically falls once a supply shock is absorbed in order to avoid exacerbating the risks that temporary supply shock morphs into a negative demand shock. But the combination of several supply shocks may create an inflationary shock of such a size and persistence that inflation may risk getting entrenched. For central banks, it is not easy to address such a situation for a number of reasons. The first reason is that monetary policy influences demand and with a lack. It cannot do much against the initial spike in inflation triggered by a supply shock Rather, monetary policy initially acts by lowering demand expectations, making it more difficult to assess how much restriction is necessary to bring inflation back to target. The second reason is the difficulty to assess how long it will take for supply shocks to unwind and for this unwinding to reach prices. Similarly, there is uncertainty on the speed and strength of the pass-through of the monetary uh, uh, tightening to the real economy. This increases the risks of policy errors on both sides. So today's session is of great relevance for the current monetary policy debate. We are first going to hear from Silvana Tenreiro, member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England. Silvana will have 25 minutes to present a paper co-authored with colleagues from the Bank of England. And she will address the topic of this session with particular emphasis on the role that should or should not be given to inflation expectations. Daniel Gross, director of the Institute of European Policy Making at Bocconi University, will then have 15 minutes to discuss the paper. There will be subsequently the opportunity for questions and answers. Participants wishing to comment or ask questions could prepare to raise their hands virtually if you are following online. So, Silvana, let me thank you for accepting our invitation and for your very interesting paper. The floor is yours. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone, um, and thank you for having me. Uh, I will talk about monetary policy in the face of supply shocks. And this is joint work with my colleagues at the Bank of England, Nicolo Bandera, Lauren Barnes, Matthew Chava, and Lucas von den Berg. The usual disclaimer applies. The paper represents our views and not those of the bank or any of its committees. So in this paper, we address three perennial questions in macroeconomics. First, how should monetary policy respond to a supply shock? Second, how would that response change if supply shocks became more frequent? And third, what should inflation expectations, what role should inflation expectations play in the assessment and calibration of that response? And let me start with a preview of the main takeaways from our analysis and our reading of the literature. First, whether monetary policy should look through, tighten, or loosen in response to a single supply shock depends on the nature and duration of the shock, on the strength of second round effects, and on the shock's effects on real incomes and demand. Efficiency considerations also add nuance to the response. Second, if a sequence of negative supply shocks keeps inflation above target for a longer period, signs of drifting inflation expectations or stronger backward-looking inertia would call for a tighter policy response. But third, the mapping between measures of expectations and policy is not a straightforward one. Despite their prominence in economic models and policy thinking, our understanding of the formation and the impact of expectations on pricing behavior and activity remains limited. It is a humbling exercise to read, in particular, the most recent literature on expectations. This suggests caution on pinning policy decisions too strongly on measures of expectations or in using inflation expectations as intermediate targets for policy. The soundest policy, as always, is to focus on returning inflation to target in the medium term. In answering the first question, how should monetary policy respond to a single supply shock? The first observation is that supply shocks come in different shapes and sizes. We focus on a particular shock, a global increase in energy prices, as seen from the perspective of an energy importing economy. The orthodox monetary policy response to a global shock to energy prices is to look through them. For instance, in 2011, UK inflation rose above 5%, largely owing to a sharp increase in global energy prices. The Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee did not raise interest rates in response, and when the shock faded, inflation returned to the 2% target. The rationale for looking through energy price shock, shocks is that the main effects of monetary policy on the economy come through with a lag. Estimates of the speed of policy transmission vary, but the peaked impact, impact of policy on inflation typically comes sometime beyond the first year following a change in the policy rate. That makes responding to short-lived price level impacts of energy shocks counterproductive, since they drop out of the annual inflation calculation by the time the policy impact is, is at its peak. Trying to offset the shock with an increase in the policy rate would cause more inflation volatility rather than less, making it more difficult to meet the inflation target in the medium term. So for concreteness, in this chart, we illustrate some stylized paths for inflation in the case of an unexpected increase in global energy prices that raises measured inflation from 2 to 6%. After 12 months, Assuming energy prices remain at their new higher level but do not experience another unexpected shock, the energy contribution to headline inflation will disappear and the headline inflation rate should fall back to target. <clears throat> the inflation path under the looking through scenario is the one illustrated here in the blue line. Now, rather than looking through the shock, the central bank could try to lean against the shock by tightening monetary policy, as illustrated by the various dotted orange lines. However, as said, monetary policy works with a lag, building towards peak effectiveness 12 to 18 months after the, um, the intervention. 
If, for example, the central bank wanted to achieve the inflation target six months after the shock, it could quickly and more aggressively tighten monetary policy when the shock hits. But because policy works with a lag, to hit the target at six months, the central bank would need to be willing to undershoot the inflation target at 12 months and subsequently bring inflation back to target from below by loosening monetary policy. This would be the dashed orange line path uh, illustrated here. Many other paths are policy, but uh, possible, but given the nature of the specific shock, any shortening of the period uh, of above target inflation will necessarily come at the cost of undershooting uh, the inflation target for some period in the medium term, the various dotted orange lines here. For a central bank with a symmetric forward-looking inflation target, it's not obvious that shortening the period of above target inflation at the cost of incurring a period of below target inflation is the optimal thing to do. If, moreover, the central bank has a secondary objective to limit output or employment volatility, it may indeed be a suboptimal sub uh, path to follow. This conclusion changes when there are important second round effects. As uh, Olivier Blanchard and Jordi Galli point out in their now classical paper, real rigidities can give rise to inertia or second round effects. For instance, wages, benefits, or certain prices could be indexed to headline inflation, delaying the return of inflation to target. From the perspective of an energy importing economy, an increase in global energy prices is an adverse terms of trade shock. Real incomes and real wages fall on impact, but every, if everyone tries to resist a fall in their real income and firms try to defend their real profits by raising domestically set prices, real resistance can lead to nominal inertia and delay the return of inflation to target. This is akin to a cost push shock in the simple New Keynesian model. Abstracting from questions of timing and policy lags for a moment, the Phillips curve shifts inward and the central bank faces the trade-off between stabilizing inflation and stabilizing the welfare-relevant output gap, as illustrated here uh, in this chart. In this chart, we assume the central bank seeks to minimize the sum of inflation deviations from target and output deviations from potential, subject to the aggregate supply constraint of the economy given by the new Keynesian Phillips curve. The resulting monetary policy response, MR here, depends on the relative weight the central bank places on stabilizing output vis-a-vis -vis stabilizing inflation, represented by the parameter lambda in the canonical specification. The central bank here will raise interest rates to reduce inflation, effectively leaning against the inertia that stems from real income resistance. But it will not try to return inflation to target immediately, given the impact on employment or output. This is a different rationale for moderation or caution than the one discussed before. In there, the central bank faced a trade-off between above target inflation in the near term and below target inflation in the medium term. Here instead, the central bank faces a trade-off between stabilizing inflation and stabilizing output. The bottom line is that in the presence of second round effects, looking through energy shocks may no longer be optimal. By tightening monetary policy, the central bank can bring inflation back to target more quickly without necessarily pushing inflation below target further out, as illustrated by the dashed orange line in this chart. The policy prescription becomes a bit uh, more nuanced in multi-sector models with downward nominal rigidities when sectors have differential exposure to the energy price shock. In that case, efficiency considerations may call for changes in relative prices, which can be facilitated by somewhat ag higher aggregate inflation. This is illustrated in this chart. Relative prices of more energy intensive goods should go up as the supply curve con contracts, uh, as shown here in the left hand side. Substitution will lead to an expansion in non energy intensive sectors, the dashed line in the right hand side chart. Uh, here. With downward nominal rigidities, the relative price adjustment calls for some accommodation of inflation. And this is what Veronica Guerrieri, uh, Michaela Marcus, and uh, Lucrezia Reiklin and I discussed in depth in the Geneva report, building on Veronica's um, Jackson Hole uh, paper. But here I want to focus on what happens when the real income effects from the, the adverse 
terms of trade shock is strong, as formalized in a recent paper by Adriano Clare and his co-authors. The point they stress is that in a heterogeneous agent model with financial constraints, the real income loss due to an energy uh, shock can lead to a reduction in aggregate demand, which endogenously reduces the persistence in persistent inflationary effects of the energy shock. This channel, illustrated by the dotted orange line in the uh, right-hand side chart here, can push inflation below target in the medium term. My colleagues, uh, Jenny Chan and co-authors at the bank, make a similar point in a tractable two-agent new Keynesian model, TANK. Um, this chart shows the impulse responses of consumption, inflation, and the nominal policy rate to an energy price shock in both an open economy representative agent model, RANK, and a two-agent new Keynesian model, TANK. The central bank leans against inflation by raising interest rates, which creates a further reduction in aggregate consumption. But compared to the representative agent baseline, the two-agent model with some constrained households generates a weaker path for both consumption and inflation in response to the energy shock, which requ requires a looser path for monetary policy to return inflation to target in the medium term. As Chan and co-authors highlight, and in line with Eau Claire and co-authors, for sufficiently severe financial constraints, the optimal monetary policy response could be an outright loosening of the monetary policy stance. In an economy that exhibits both second round effects and household or sectoral heterogeneity, the appropriate monetary policy response to an energy price shock is not straightforward quantitatively or even qualitatively. It's not obvious that the central bank can improve on the path for inflation that incorporates both second round effects from the inflation overshoot and the demand weakness from the terms of trade shock weighing on inflation in the medium term, the solid line, uh, blue line here. Tightening policy helps reduce second round effects, but risks pushing inflation below target and output below potential in the medium term, the dashed orange line. Loosening policy could help the medium term outlook for both inflation and output, but would keep inflation higher in the near term and above target for longer, as illustrated in the dotted orange line. Um, and so this is the colorful summary so far for a single shock, more research facilitating the quantification of all these channels would help address the challenges monetary policy could face with similar shocks in the future. Um, now, rather than a single uh, shock, economies around the world, uh, including the UK and the Euro area, have experienced an extraordinary succession of external shocks over the past two years, which have pushed inflation very far above target. The question is, what should monetary policy do when there are multiple inflationary shocks in succession? Some economists have argued that we should expect to experience more and large adverse supply hits in coming decades. But more frequent and systematically adverse supply shocks could be seen as akin to a downward shift in trend growth, with a likely increase in, vol in volatility around that trend. Lower potential trend growth will endogenously lead to lower trend demand, and the result of those two forces might not necessarily be inflationary, unless, of course, private consumption and investment cannot foresee the effectively lower trend pattern. In other words, lower potential growth would not require necessarily a tighter policy stance on average, unless households, firms, and markets systematically overestimate supply over time, in which case policy would be needed to close that demand supply imbalance. But what happens when there is a sequence of inflationary shocks in succession without any change in the longer term uh, 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 patterns? In principle, monetary policy could operate as usual, responding to each shock as if it occurred in isolation. But responding to each shock individually, trading off every time near term against medium term inflation and inflation deviations from target with output deviations from uh, potential could result in a long period of above target inflation. The models discussed so far all implicitly assume that households' expectations remain well anchored at the target um, in the medium term. 
But the question is, can this assumption reasonably be maintained if inflation remains above target for multiple years? And once we depart from the rational benchmark, there is an infinite variety of ways in which people could form expectations and in which those expectations could affect behavior. Indeed, even with a rational setting, as Ivan Berning um, makes clear in his recent paper, deviations from the standard sticky price Calvo model mean that inflation expectations would typically have a different, in his case, smaller effect on pricing than the nearly one-to-one -one relation uh, implied by the Calvo setting. Improving, in our, improving our understanding of the role of expectations uh, on the economy is, of course, an important area of research in macroeconomics, but it also calls for humility. As economic researchers, we are on the edge of our area of expertise when it comes to people's expectations, veering into the fields of psychology and neuroscience. The models that deviate from rational expectations have different and interesting implications for the nuances of monetary policy strategy. But the overarching takeaway is that, much like in the case of real wage resistance, the more inflation expectations drift away from target following an inflationary shock, the more monetary policy would need to lean against inertia to return inflation to the target. In the second part of the paper, we turn to the literature on inflation expectations and focus on two sets of questions. First, what factors shape those expectations, and in particular, how does monetary policy affect expectations? And second, uh, how do expectations affect pricing and activity? Uh, on the first question, what factors shape expectations, the literature led by Kovion and Gorodnichenko finds that expectations tend to track spot inflation very closely. Inflation expectations also show a very high sensitivity to some volatile components of the basket, energy in the case of firms, and both uh, food and petrol for households. Regarding the role played by monetary policy in shaping those expectations, our analysis and the literature uh, do not point to systematic evidence of a direct impact from innovations or news in interest rates on inflation expectations. And when there is an effect, perhaps contrary to economists' expectations, households and firms more often than not respond that interest rate increases lead to higher price or cost inflation. The evidence instead is more supportive of the standard indirect effect of monetary policy via actual inflation and demand current or future, which is a mechanism, the demand channel embedded in most new Keynesian models. Turning to how expectations affect activity and pricing, the literature finds higher inflation expectations may increase or decrease consumption and investment. This reflects a tension between a standard real interest rate channel, which should boost activity, versus a real income effect which depresses activity. In other words, the impact seems to depend on whether households or firms perceive inflation as driven by positive demand or negative supply factors. On the impact of uh, expectations on pricing, the evidence is also inconclusive, in part uh, because there are challenging identification issues at play. On the theory front, there is new uh, work, but as I mentioned by Ivan Berning, uh, showing that the quantitative impact of expectations on pricing might depend on the modality of price setting, with Calvo price setting giving the maximum impact. Uh, Ivan's work also points out that as inflation increases, price, prices should become more flexible, and hence expectations become less relevant than spot or past inflation in setting prices or wages. Um, so back to um, the main takeaways. Uh, first, the optimal monetary policy response to a single supply shock depends on the nature and duration of the shock, the strength of second round effects, and the impact of the shock on real incomes and demand, as well as efficiency considerations. The relative strength of these factors determine whether monetary policy should look through 
tighten or loosen and by how much. Second, a sequence of inflationary supply shocks could result in a long period of above target inflation if the central bank uh, were to respond to each shock individually, trading off near term against medium term inflation and inflation deviations from target with uh, output gap. Drifting inflation expectations or backward looking inertia in that case would call for a tighter policy response. But third, despite their prominence in economic models and policy thinking, understanding of the formation and economic impact of expectations uh, is still limited and a large gap remains between standard model assumptions uh, on, on expectations and their actual patterns of behavior. In particular, empirically, households and firm inflation expectations tend to move with actual inflation and are often highly sensitive to some volatile components of the basket, uh, particularly energy. Identified monetary policy shocks appear to affect actual inflation, but do not seem to have a direct impact on households or firms' inflation expectations over and above their impact on inflation. Recent empirical and theoretical work has challenged existing priors and assumptions on how inflation expectations affect pricing, suggesting a weaker impact of expected inflation on prices than the nearly one-for-one -one link implied by standard cargo models. In turn, when inflation is driven by a supply shock, higher inflation expectations can be associated with weaker consumption and investment, while the opposite is true when inflation is viewed as demand-driven. And so overall, given, um, first, the high sensitivity of household and firm measures of inflation expectations to volatile components of the basket. Second, their limited reaction to monetary policy over and above the effects of policy on actual inflation. And third, their uncertain effects on the economy call for some caution in using households or firms' measures of inflation expectations as intermediate targets to guide central banks' uh, policy decision. I will pause here, um, uh, Fabio. And, uh... Thank you very much, Silvana. For... Thank you. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Before I give the floor to Daniel, let me remind participants to get ready to raise your hands, physical or virtual. Daniel, you have the floor. Thank you for being here. I wanted to thank the organizers for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here, uh, especially at this juncture when we are facing all these uh, supply shocks and uh, expectations of inflation are doing things which we don't expect them to do. It's actually a theme which was already discussed uh, last year at last year's Sintra conference, but now of course we are one year on, we are perhaps a bit wiser and have uh, a bit more, more data also. It's a particular pleasure to uh, comment this uh, paper which has really well-rounded, uh, lays out first the theoretical background, um, and then it provides a really thorough review of the literature uh, of uh, the nexus uh, between, uh, oh sorry, I forgot here, uh, the nexus uh, between uh, um, expectations, uh, monetary policy, um, and uh, uh, how they work together to have then an impact uh, on the economy. Now, um, when you have such a uh, well-rounded paper, then the question is, what do you do as a discussant? And uh, I would like uh, to make uh, three small contributions. By first of all, looking at the evidence of some of the factors which Silvana mentioned as being decisive for the impact of uh, supply shocks on the economy namely real wage rigidity and the importance of financially constrained uh, households. And then asking uh, what f shocks actually we're facing today. And there, perhaps, I will try to take at heart the dictum of Kierkegaard, which President Lagarde mentioned yesterday, to live in the future. Try not just look in the past, but also 
to try to see, okay, what actually should we be expecting? Um, and then finally, perhaps a small compliment uh, to uh, the work which uh, Silvana mentioned only en passant, her own work on the, uh, on the UK, on the nexus between uh, supply shocks uh, and expectations, just doing something similar for the euro area, uh, because my contention would be that actually the euro area and the UK in some respects are very comparable because they have a similar degree of energy uh, dependency. And actually, by chance, the degree of openness in terms of goods trade is exactly the same, 21% of GDP. So in that sense, at least, they're comparable. Of course, there's a different size, but not a difference uh, in openness. So the first point is, as uh, Silvana mentioned, um, from our models and from common sense, you can have a, a, a price, wage price spiral when you have real wage rigidity. I would submit that there's no evidence of real wage rigidity, comma, at least in this case. The question, of course, is how do you measure real wage rigidity? On the left-hand side, I've given you both for the UK, <coughs> sorry, for the US, and for the euro area, and the uh, real wages measured by the CPI. Right? And there you can see, I mean, they really have taken it on the chin workers. Right? One cannot really fault them for not accepting the loss of purchasing power. On the right-hand side, I think that is too often forgotten, uh, I have deflated wages by the GDP deflator because that is the relevant price index if you look at it from the producer side. And maybe if there had not been, if there had been no movement in that indicator, you could think about wage rigidity. But I would submit to you there has been, by the way, extraordinarily similar development on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, even GDP deflated wages have fallen. Of course, the question is always where do they go in the future? Uh, we can discuss that in a bit, but I would therefore submit no evidence for wage rigidity, comma, but that also means that the increase in energy prices is not really a good excuse or reason for expecting high inflation, core inflation, right? Uh, the second point, as Ivana mentioned also, which is important for gauging the impact of an energy price shock um, on, uh, on the economy is the degree to which we have uh, <coughs> financially constrained consumers. And we all know that uh, there has been a huge uh, increase in well, excess savings. Here I've taken just the amount of uh, deposits by households over and above the, the trend line. Uh, for the euro area only, I think for the US the picture is similar. Uh, and what's interesting I find is there has been a very large, um, uh, whatever, excess savings, 40% of GDP almost, if you look at the difference between the two lines, which has now been almost fully reabsorbed. So we had a period there, again, the past might be different from the future. We had a period when there were few financially constrained households, and now we are, might, might be getting back to the, uh, quote unquote, more normal situation. Okay, the next point is what actually supply shocks are we, we facing? And here I would like to go into um, the development because I think it is not sufficiently recognized uh, that these shocks have been actually exposed temporarily. All the models, and of course also the things that, uh, the, the, the charts which um, Silvana presented, assume a permanent shock for energy, for example. Natural because we assume that energy prices follow a random walk. Once they go up, best prediction is they stay. But they have gone up and have come down. You know, the best prediction should be that they stay down. Um, so, uh, and therefore, uh, I think uh, this has to be taken into account. But, the, of course, the economic impact would be very different. Again, that's a point uh, Silvana made, depending on where the terms of trade uh, went. And then we have the supply chain shock, which I would argue uh, that it was, ex should have been expected ex ante to be temporary. Because it was basically a problem of uh, temporary dislocation in supply chains. Here I have given you uh, the one indicator of the Federal Reserve, I believe, um, where I draw attention to the scale uh, because there it's in standard deviation. So you have really something exceptional. 
four standard deviations against from the past. But actually my title is, is wrong there because supply chain pressures have disappeared. Right? In that sense, we are back to the pre, pre-pandemic pre normal. So that was something temporary. Um, and the echo effect of that should actually be positive for the future. Now, for uh, energy, I would submit that you should look at two prices uh, separately. One is oil price. And of course, the second one will be natural gas. I come to that. And the oil price here has given you uh, both uh, the, the, the prices in the US and in the euro area in national currency. Because at times, they were very different. You see that in 2008, right, when the dollar price increased a lot, but not the euro price, uh, whereas more recently, the difference has been smaller. What I wanted to show with this picture is actually that, A, of course, you see that price has gone up and down. So the shock is, has been retraced. The second point is that we are now at a level which we have had in the past several times. We have had these ups and downs in the past, even more extreme to some extent, without inflation. So I think the task for our models and theories is to explain why with a shock, which is very similar to what we had in the past, we have inflation which is not at all similar to the past. And uh, I think that is, that is uh, very important. Uh, of course, what you also see here is, and that comes about in many discussions, what is the baseline? If you take the deepest or the best point for us at the height of the corona crisis, when oil prices went negative, of course, we have had a huge shock. But maybe the central banks then should have seen that there was a temporary positive supply shock, right? And it should have seen through it. Um, okay, but whatever, that's the past uh, right now. I think we are back in a situation which we cannot claim to be exceptional. Um, on uh, the price of natural gas, it might be difficult to see. You see two lines, blue and red, which are very closely correlated. And one is the TTF price, the famous Amsterdam spot price. And the other one, which is following closely, is the Japan-Korea Japan marker. Just to indicate that in Asia, basically, the spot price moved one to one with our European price. And then you see a green line down there, which doesn't budge at all. And that's the happy US, where uh, basically it is, there's too much uh, gas, natural gas, which cannot be exported more quickly enough, and therefore uh, prices will stay down. So um, that is the picture in terms of energy price. I would claim not really totally exceptional, and most of that already back to back to or normal or pre, pre-pandemic. Uh, now, of course, as Sivan also mentioned, from the point of view of a net energy importer, you then uh, have a negative terms of trade impact, which impacts demand, and then impacts the uh, probability that you have excess demand in the non-tradable sector. For the uh, your area, I've given you the calculations, which I think representatives of the ECP have also made in the, in the past. So the loss of terms of trade was rather substantial. Um, whereas for the U.S., let me perhaps go immediately here, um, it was of a very different size. Here you see the red line, that's the United States. You see actually that the U.S. has had a major improvement in the terms of trade. So you have, if you want, a temporary supply shock, but at the same time a boost to the domestic demand, right? which was an additional factor driving inflation, whereas in our case, the, the, the green line, you see how much peak to stuff, right? The peak of what was temporary was uh, COVID. Uh, there was a deterioration of which I would say most of it has been traced back. The latest data point is Q1. I bet you if you take Q2 2023, we'll be back to the, to the, to the one, one line, which is the, the average. So I would say in terms, of trade, in terms of the terms of trade, we have actually come back in, in, uh, in Europe. So that brings me to my major issue. How can we explain sticky inflation with shocks which at least exposed were temporary? Right? Temporary supply shocks in Silvana's models and others should leave the price level unaffected in the long run. First goes up and then goes down. Right? 
and we talked about that already last year, right? That supply shocks supposedly have a strong immediate impact on the way up, but why not on the way down? Right? How can we explain that uh, when these shocks are over, probably have a price level which is 10, 10 to 12 percentage, 15 percentage points higher in two or three years than before the shocks with energy prices and the global value chains being, being back to normal? Um, there we must have some asymmetries. And it's not real wage uh, resistance. It's not that nominal wages don't go down because right, they're very far from, from being uh, even stable. Um, and then the question is, could expectations be responsible? And that is, of course, where Silvana uh, did a lot of work. I mean, I show you here just to the extent to which this confirms what Silvana said, which is that uh, visible prices, energy prices, this is the HICP energy, drive a lot of the expectations, short-term expectations. I think uh, Ricardo Reis uh, last year already mentioned that if you take the long-term expectations, they're basically uninformative because they're flat. They take their data from the ECB bulletin and, and say, that's it, uh, what will happen. But uh, if you look at the more the, 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 um, the shorter run variations, here, as I mentioned, we have done a complement to what uh, Silvana did a similar bar for the euro area, and I won't go into the details. Some of them are available in the slides which are on the internet, um, on the website, sorry. Um, but basically we confirm her, uh, her findings uh, that uh, inf inflation expectations follow to a large extent uh, energy price shocks, but also finding that I find interesting that energy price shocks seem to drive ECB policy in the past, right? Think about the famous 2011 mistake exposed. That was one of the cases of a temporary supply shock. Okay, let me st uh, stop here. Um, my uh, contention is that the major supply shocks which we have seen turned out to have been temporary. And we have to explain why they have had such a sticky uh, impact. And uh, I think only if you feel comfortable with that explanation can we then also set policy and set our expectations. Because a priori, the future, the next 12 months, should be a rerun of the last with the opposite sign. Right? Energy looks good, no longer supply pressures, and so on. And uh, it is uh, with this conundrum that I would like to leave you and apologies for the 15 minutes overdraft. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel, for your presentation. And I'm sure that now you are burning to ask questions. So let me remind you that you are supposed to raise your hands. But while we collect questions, I would give the floor to Silvana for a comment, response to uh, Daniel's presentation. Very good, thank you. Uh, Fabio, thank you. Um, thank you, Daniel, for the comments, uh, very helpful. Um, so I, I would briefly comment on a couple of things. I think what this underscores is importance of understanding the whole input supply chain and how the energy shock transmits through the various sectors in the economy and through these input-output linkages. Because even core sectors are very dependent on energy, so we cannot you know, completely separate. And in this, I want to highlight on the theoretical side the, the work that Elisa Rubo has done on highlighting these input-output linkages. And on mo the more empirical side, the work that um, Shebnem Kalemli Oskan uh, and co authors, and then uh, in the Geneva report, Veronica Guerrieri and co authors, highlighting how a temporary shock by the time it permeates through the rest of the economy, you know, can, can have a, um, a slightly longer lasting. But we haven't seen the end of the story. So the question is how quickly inflation will come back. And so that's, that's an open question. Um, it took, you know, it took a year and a half to go up. Uh, how, how long will it take to, uh, to go down? And uh, um, I agree with you that um, 
uh, sort of th th there is more to that than just uh, real resistance. Part of that is, is a natural process. Those prices, those high energy prices last year are still in the inventories or of many companies. And, uh, and then there's an additional question, of course, that is this guy's lively in Europe uh, with profit margins and so on. Um, uh, and just to highlight uh, Europe, uh, the Euro area and the UK obviously were exposed to the same shock in a different way than the US. Quantitatively, however, the size of the shock was very different. Uh, the cumulative increase in energy prices, retail energy prices in the UK, was 115% at peak. For Europe, for, for the Euro area, that reached peak at 80%, but then unwind very quickly, unwound very quickly. Uh, in the UK, because of the um, off-gem uh, mechanism of price setting, it takes a bit longer for that to unwind, and we've seen the first um, tranche down, but there's still more to go. Uh, in the US, again, it's a very different story because it's not a net importing uh, economy, it's a net exporter on the margin, and uh, energy prices went up only by 30%, only <laughs> by 30%, and again, uh, reversed very quickly. So, but, so these are very, very different uh, shocks uh, quantitatively uh, and, and then qualitatively across the Atlantic. Um, I'll stop there, um, Fabio, and perhaps we can. Uh, Let me remind you that you should keep your questions within 60 seconds. So I see Volker, then Ricardo, Lucrezia, I saw you, then Lucrezia. And then please uh, ask the floor also from home. Don't be shy. Can you please identify yourself? Even yes, uh, for Kavila and Goethe University, yeah. Frankfurt. Uh, thank you very much. Just, um, I try to be brief, but I would like to submit a, a different uh, narrative. All the discussion was about en a sequence of energy price shocks. But I think you need to go back to the pandemic, 2020, the policy response which lasted well into 2022, and then the Ukraine exogenous shock. But if you look at models who combine macro and epidemic modeling, just like Eigenbauer, Bella, Trabant, a new Keynesian model, and you simulate a pandemic or you study a pandemic, you will find that you can have an 8% of GDP recession with a very mild inflation this inflation impact of 60 basis points. That's because the gap between supply, between potential and GDP is much, much smaller than 8%, about 1%. On top of this, so that's what, from that perspective, explains quite well what happened in 2020, namely a very mild disinflationary effect. But then you have a very expansionary policy, monetary policy, fiscal policy, un I mean, unprecedented, lasting well into 2022, all throughout 2021. So you have high demand side support and an endogenous response as the economy recovers and an endogenous rise in energy prices. So the foundation of inflation was laid, in my view, because of that very strong and lasting support. And as luck has it, you know, inflation was at five, six percent at the end of 2021, 2022. Then on top, you get a temporary shock like the Ukraine war. But the if that story is right, you have to remove that foundation of agri demand, and you cannot wait just for this to go away by itself. Maybe we, we take another question, then you will answer both. Ricardo? Thank you. Ricardo Reis from the London School of Economics. Silvan, you concluded, and I think I'm reading it right, our understanding of the formation and economic impact of expectation remains limited, suggests caution on policy decisions to rely strong on expectation measures. Going back just an hour ago to Madame Lagarde's speech, she did mention expectations in one paragraph. She also mentioned, and I ask us to replace in that sentence, productivity. Surely our understanding of the formation of productivity and how it evolves quarter to quarter is also very limited and how it transmits to labor costs is very hard. She mentioned profit margins. Boy, there we barely even have a literature where profit margins, markups sometimes go up, sometimes go down. It depends strongly on industry, it depends strongly on sector. And third, wage formation, which continues to be very hard to understand in terms of what we've observed even in the recent past. So when you ask for humility, should I understand that you're asking for humility with regards to all economic indicators, and I think I've covered all 
And if I went back yesterday to Gita Gopinath and employment, financial stability, one can also talk about our difficulties in their formation and impact. And therefore, to have a much stronger focus in on inflation, I guess. Or is there something about expectations that led you to highlight that in terms of your talk? Thank you. So should, should I respond? Yes. Um, so let me start with uh, Ricardo. Um, I mean, definitely, I guess I agree with you that we, we should be humble in general, and that's why we have a big um, um, fund charts when, when we do our inflation projections. And uh, sometimes uh, those, the numbers, the, the point estimates are taken literally, and people don't understand the uncertainty surrounding those estimates. Um, and, or, or get uh, too trapped in the exact point estimates without taking into account the probability distribution and the conditionality of many of these forecasts. So I would agree with you. Um, the reason I focus mostly on, expect on expectations is because perhaps this is the most uncertain area because there is a projection forward by actors that perhaps don't have the tools to um, you know, perform those projections. and. Uh, and uh, within the whole setting uh, of, of uh, you know, if you think of uh, profit, ma profit margins, wage formation, I mean, we are, we are seeing it on the ground. It's not a projection. It's something that we can observe more and more in real time. And, uh, but I agree with you that when we project those forwards, there is you know, ample, ample scope for uncertainty. Um, and uh, same with productivity, and obviously we have a very active uh, field in economics, right, to understand productivity and, uh, you know, what drives it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the, my focus on expectations is because it comes mostly of, you know, mostly in, in, in the context of these discussions, but I would, just, I would fully agree with you that all these other aspects are, are uh, hugely important. Um, and on, on Volker, I mean, Volker, of course, I am fully aware of uh, what happened, and uh, um, I aggregate demand, uh, you know, the, the responses of monetary and fiscal policy during the pandemic were extraordinary. We were in extraordinary times. It was once in a uh, lifetime uh, shock. Um, you might question when the support should have stopped or not, but we haven't seen, certainly in Europe, and this is very different again from the US, we haven't seen an expansion in aggregate demand. In the UK in particular, um, uh, consumption is not back at the level of 2019 pre-COVID, so we're not talking about an overheated demand, we're talking about a severe supply shock that led to a substantial response um, by policy makers, and then obviously there's a quantitative debate on uh, you know, the size of that response and, and, and when to end it, but you know, that's, that's a separate one. Uh, for the US, the situation is very different because uh, in the US, um, as you know, consumption recovered to pre-COVID le levels early in 2021, overtook uh, the pre-COVID trend by the middle of uh, 2021. So we've seen really you know, a boom uh, following, uh, following COVID. Very, very different uh, from what happened in Europe. Uh, the Euro, Euro area is still well below the pre-COVID trend. And as I said, the UK is below the pre-COVID level. So it's, it's a very different picture uh, in, in, in the jurisdictions. Um, I think Silvana did a perfect summary, and I think the key point is, as you uh, mentioned, uh, in the Euro area, as in the UK, domestic demand doesn't show uh, signs of overboarding and uh, uh, therefore being a driver of inflation. What I would submit is that maybe uh, the delayed effect of the monetary easing still going on in 2021 uh, should be felt, should have been felt in 2022 and should now be slowly fading out. Uh, that could have been one of the additional elements last year. I already have a long list. I see nobody asking the floor from Zoom. Um, am I wrong? Or I don't see anything on, on my screen. But anyway, I have on my list, I, I've certainly forgotten somebody. Lucrezia, Jordi, uh, Robert, Christine, and Tiff. Then we will see. OK, Lucrezia. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment uh, on uh, two important points that Daniel made uh, on, um, on oil price. I, I think you made two points. Uh, we had similar shock uh, in oil, 
but in energy, but a very different response from the past on inflation. And the second point is it matters whether the energy shock is temporary or permanent. So I'd like to offer uh, some empirical evidence, which is actually in the Geneva report that we co authored with Silvana, that uh, in the past, uh, in the euro area, I mean, if you shock uh, you know, the economy with an exogenous oil shock and you look at the general equilibrium effect, uh, Actually, core inflation reacts with a lag, and from the first shock until it returns to the steady state is about 60 months. So I think that is more or less, uh, so we are still in the norm of what we have seen in the past. And the second thing is that the core is a lagging indicator with respect to headline. So this is uh, a feature that uh, maybe is different in the US economy, but is incredibly robust. Uh, in the euro economy, so I think it's very important to get this fact straight. Thanks. Jo Jordi, I, 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 where are you? There, there, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Just a quick comment on Daniel's discussion. Uh, the fact that real wages have declined somewhat in terms of the GDP, the GDP deflator, which is the relevant measure, as you said, is not a proof my opinion that there are no real wage rigidities. We don't have a counterfactual. We don't know how much real wages should have gone down in the absence of real wage rigidities. And I would claim that the fact that inflation has gone up that much, in particular GDP deflator inflation, is uh, indirect evidence that real wages didn't go down as much as a, a, wor uh, a model with fully flexible wages uh, would have implied. What was? Um, I agree with Lucrez. <laughs> the, the, uh, yeah, so it, and it's part of this input-output diffusion of, of the shock, and, and that's what uh, uh, we have in the Geneva report and in previous work that Lucrezia has done. Uh, and with Jordi, yes, I, I, I agree. I guess it was mostly a comment to, um, uh, to Daniel, but uh, there has been, certainly we've seen in, in the UK, uh, some degree of resistance, and, and the fact that real wages fell somewhat is not proof that those rigidities are not in certain sectors and certain uh, parts of the economy. Um, um. Okay. So. okay, I have uh, three more questions. If you are quick, we can uh, accommodate all three and let's see other hands. But let's start with Robert, then Christine, then Tiff. Robert. This gentleman. Th thanks, a very simple question in answer to the question which uh, Daniel posed there. In the US, sir, we had no uh, uh, terms of trade shock, but we had a lot of fiscal expansion. In Europe, we had that with a lot of fiscal expansion, and if we put both together, fiscal expansion and high debt plays a role in inflation dynamics. And uh, we just had a paper on the BIS last week by Cochrane about it. So. What this uh, about of a unifying explanation why we have this inflation? Can you pass the mic to Kristin? Thank you. Thank you. Kristen Forbes from MIT. So last night at the dinner speech, Gita raised an uncomfortable truth that uh, central bankers needed to think more carefully about how they responded to supply shocks. This paper is an excellent response, very timely, very quick. Um, but it is very, very nice how it lays out clearly what characteristics of the supply shock determine the optimal response. So I think this is a great uh, resource for central bankers now. Um, but with that in mind, I was wondering if you could talk about how your results would change if you extended the model along two characteristics of the recent supply shock. First, one characteristic of the recent energy shock is that countries have responded with large policy responses, energy price caps, um, and targeted subsidies. And that has mitigated the impact of the big price rise on demand and inflation. We'll hear more about that in Pierre Olivier's excellent paper tomorrow. But if you then take away some of this effect on consumption and inflation, how does that change what is the optimal monetary policy response? Um, second extension, uh, the characteristic of this shock is that the supply shocks were very large. So you can get nonlinear effects, which we'll also hear about later. So if you get nonlinear effects on wage bargaining and price setting, how will that affect your implications for the optimal monetary policy response? Well, Sylvana and Danielle, thank you both for uh, excellent presentations. My question, Sylvana, is as you've looked at inflation expectations, 
what do you think the horizon is that matters the most for monetary policy? I mean, as you showed, longer run expectations have been very well anchored. That's been a great source of comfort to central bankers. Uh, but on the other hand, short run expectations have moved around a lot. And you know, going back to President Lagarde's opening remarks, when you think of firms setting their their prices, uh, how you know uh, wage bargainers setting their wages, if those short run expectations are more important for that. Um, situation might be more complicated and certainly at least in the Canadian case if you look at survey expectations of inflation at the short run they are above our own forecast so to put it more provocatively I mean are we taking a bit of false comfort that longer run expectations are well anchored last question um, last year uh, uh, John Milbao uh, last year, I talked about the inadequacy of central bank models and the chart that Daniel Gross uh, put up of um, how excess liquidity has uh, evolved post-pandemic and how it's declined since is really important. Um, differences in household portfolios between the UK and, and the Eurozone uh, have a huge implication for uh, differences in, in monetary policy responses and also how the, the real economy is going to respond. And as, as Christine uh, Lagarde pointed out yesterday, um, the, uh, at the difference, actually this morning, the difference between floating rate and fixed rate mortgages, that, that's, that those structural differences, uh, another really important feature that distinguishes the UK from, from the Eurozone. Thank you. Okay, let, let me start with that last one. Um, John, yes, excess liquidity uh, played a big role in, you know, in, uh, in the forecasting models uh, of the bank, and this was a reason why we had uh, very strong demand in, in the recovery from the pandemic in the projections. As he, and uh, my colleague Ben Broadman has a nice description of the forecast at the time, given that, that excess, excess savings, and it connects to what uh, Daniel discussed, we were expect, expecting a much faster recovery in, um, in demand from the COVID pandemic. But then the war hit, and then what we saw is actually we undershot um, massively because the, 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 um, uh, the war represented a big, or, or led to a, a big increase in, uh, in the price of energy, very adverse in, in terms of trade shock. So, so that played an important role uh, early on. And as Daniel mentioned, most of those um, excess uh, savings are, are now um, uh, being absorbed. Um, there was a question of what expectations matter. And this is a, is, is a crucial question. I think when we think about the anchoring, Typically, we think about longer term inflation expectations, and that's the focus. And for that, we need to resort to markets, but those markets are not the ones involved in the actual pricing decisions of firms. When we think about what determines pricing decisions by firms, well, what's the relevant horizon for them? Um, our intuition comes from sticky price models, typically you know, with an average duration of uh, prices of one year, then you would think it's one year that matters. Um, and that's you know, a point that Ivan Berning makes very clear in his recent paper, you know, short, short time expectations you know, matter um, more than those long term expectations. Um, but obviously as inflation increases, flexibil price flexibility increases. And so, you know, prices become very flexible at the extreme, those expectations shouldn't matter much. I mean, you're really setting prices based on spot inflation or past inflation. So this, I think, is an important um, aspect to work through more and, uh, you know, build that connection between academic models and, and uh, you know, firms' decision and how they switch uh, to these higher levels of flexibility. Uh, I think I'm on, on negative time, but uh, Christine, uh, yeah, great points. I mean, obviously, when we, as you know very well, uh, when we do monetary policy, we take, we consider aggregate demand with all its influences, and fiscal is a huge influ influence in there. And that, and basically, what I'm talking here is the residual shock left after fiscal policy or energy policy have done their jobs, and this is what's, what's left for monetary policy. Obviously, when you're thinking about an energy price shock, monetary policy is not the best, first best response to that. You need an energy um, policy that would take care, 
ex ante, of course, of anticipating and, and then mitigating the impact of those shocks through diversification of supply, diversification um, of trading partners, inventory policies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then comes, you know, the uh, uh, remedies uh, that you can put in place when a shock hits, and once you sort of account for all th those, then comes monetary policy and picks up the pieces left. Uh, in this case, I mean, it was full exposure to the shock, but in the future, hopefully, if we can, um, you know, address this uh, in advance in different ways, maybe maybe the shock will be less uh, impactful and, and less less work will be left to monetary policy. Um, I don't know if you want me to continue. <laughs> so many questions. Uh, but I guess that uh, connects to uh, yeah, Robert's question on fiscal. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I just wanted to emphasize we are not facing at present uh, the tailwind of a permanent shock, but actually we have had over the last six months a positive shock. So we should be living in the future. And if we had had uh, um, non-linear effects in the past on the way up, should they be also non-linear on the way down? So I come back. I think in the face of temporary shocks, we should look at the question of asymmetry, and uh, that is crucial for understanding of where the economy is going. Thank you very much. Uh, Daniel, uh, I think we need now to bring this session to a close. Uh, if I had to summarize the, 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 the main takeaways of this session, <laughs> in one sentence. I think that that sentence uh, would be that, uh, unfortunately, there is no shortcut, no intermediate target or uh, single indicator that uh, would, uh, would allow to simplify decision making uh, and the calibration of the monetary policy response to multiple supply shocks. Uh, and this is, in fact, reflected in the reaction function of the European Central Bank. We have uh, repeatedly uh, emphasize that our uh, uh, monetary uh, policy decisions are determined by our uh, assessment of the medium-term inflation outlook in light of the incoming economic and financial data, the dynamics of underlying inflation, and the strength of the monetary policy transmission. Please join me in thanking Silvana and uh, Daniel for their... for their contributions, and uh, I will now give the floor to my dear friend Frank Elderson, who will moderate the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sibana. Thanks a lot. Thanks.